Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, so last class we learned about legislation, how laws are made and so on. So today we will go to the next chapter about uh, what role does jurisprudence play further and how laws actually are developed and so on. Let's directly go to the slides without me wasting much time. One is, of course, the individual obligation. One is, of course, the individual obligation of how a person or an individual is obligated towards law. We know that laws are made. The next question before us is the individual obligation, how a person is obligated towards the law. One minute, please. What do you think is a person's obligation towards the law? Of course, a person's obligation towards the law is to obey the law. A person's obligation towards the law is to follow the law. A person's obligation towards the law is not to harm the neighbor. That's how we learned even in the law of thoughts, how the neighbor test came up in the case of Donahue versus Stevenson. So, Today, in this chapter, we are going to learn how each person is bound by the law and who is bound by the law. Now, just to set the perspective, I want you to know that there are general laws that are applicable for everyone. Of course, you know that, but all are bound by the law. There is a legal maxim which says that ignorantia lex non excusit. Ignorantia lex non excuse it now what does this mean ignorantia lex non excuse it is a legal maxim which means that ignorance of law is not excused i'm repeating ignorance of law is not excused for example if we travel to some other country say even as a tourist and god forbid you do something wrong there and say the person is arrested now, the person cannot come up with the plea saying that, well, I did not know that such and such law exists in this place. Let me give you a very simple example. For example, in UAE, poppy seeds, in English we call it poppy seeds, P-O-P-P-Y, poppy seeds are considered as illegal. You're not supposed to carry or you know import export nothing you're not supposed to carry poppy seeds with you or you know you cannot deal with poppy seeds in the uae and uh, even in the airport you know you're not supposed to you know uh, have even poppy seeds in your handbag or you know in your luggage or whatever so there was this one person who was not aware of the law he was a uh, British national, and uh, he just happened to come to UAE. And uh, at Heathrow Airport in London, uh, he happened to, uh, you know, have a hamburger. So sometimes hamburgers, they're sprinkled with poppy seeds or sometimes even sesame seeds. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this time it happened that the hamburger that he had eaten was sprinkled with poppy seeds. Now, this gentleman, he traveled through the flight and, you know, nothing happened. Just one 
a single poppy seed happened to get stuck on a shirt and you know in one of the pockets so it just happened that while he was you know they uh, you know they checked him at the airport after he arrived in uae in dubai after he landed in dubai uh the the police officials of course when they checked him they found this poppy seed and on grounds of suspicion they you know they interrogated him and somehow they came to a conclusion that i mean probably he's you know he's dealing with poppy seeds so we do not know what happened about the case no i would want to go into the details of that case but by and large what i'm trying to explain to you here is when we travel to any nation or any other country we have no excuse that we do not know the laws of that country ignorantia lex non excusit suppose we do something wrong knowingly or unknowingly and we get caught by the officials there we cannot come up with the excuse that well i did not know that such and such a law exists in this place are you understanding me so therefore there is an individual obligation for everybody and on everybody's part to follow the laws and to obey the laws of the land obey the laws of your own country and if you're traveling outside the jurisdiction of your country follow the laws of the place wherever you're traveling to so this is governed by the legal maxim i'm repeating ignorantia lex non excuse it so therefore the, any individual obligation or any personal obligation is the primary obligation of a person is to obey the laws there are general laws that are available apart from that if you enter into a contract with someone those are called contractual obligations individual contractual obligations where you contract a or say let me give you an example a contracts with b for say sale of uh, some goods for x amount whatever amount that is a consideration there and um, so that's a contract they enter into an agreement and they say that you give me these goods and i pay you x amount of money so there is an exchange there now in case there is uh, you know certain terms involving the price of the product say like i pay you your uh, a says that okay i will pay you in advance 50% and after you deliver the goods another 50% or after it reaches my warehouse another 50% and a does not pay the amount so b has got the right you know to exercise that right and get it enforced and claim it from a through the court in case a does not agree at all so therefore there is a individual obligation on the part of a this is a contractual obligation on the part of a to pay the amount to b so this is individual contractual obligation or individual legal obligation let's see what our slide say now of course in this chapter we will learn about the concept of obligation how it differs from legal obligation and how an individual is obligated towards the law now what is individual obligation every citizen and resident of a country has the moral and pro tanto legal obligation that means to the farthest extent or to the best extent possible to obey the laws of the land ignorance of the law is not a defense and this is governed under a latin maxim ignorantia lex non excusit black's law dictionary defines obligation as a moral or legal duty to perform or not perform an act some legal scholars like frederick pollock consider that the term duty and obligations are synonymous so there are people who consider that obligation and you know duty are synonymous but again black's law dictionary you know clearly defines it as a moral or a legal duty to perform or not to perform something that is an obligation he says now there are some laws which has to be abided by which has to be followed and there are laws that intersect that means it meets obligation with moral reasoning and obligation for example not to commit murder not to commit murder is not just a law but it's also a moral law it's also just you know we are not supposed to commit harm to anyone we're not supposed to murder it's a moral law it is like by moral reasoning as well as it is a legal obligation you have to follow the law you are not supposed to commit murder of course not to commit murder not to steal not to trespass human privacy or property and so on so these there are some laws which intersect obligation with moral reasoning now apart from that there are some rules which are moral and may be considered as moral and legal wrong if not abided by for example say in india sitting or continuing to do some work while the national anthem is played 
or some is a bird. It's it's it will not be taken. You know, it's not palatable. It will not be taken with a good taste. So there is no direct law, of course, forbidding sitting while the Indian national anthem is sung. However, there is a government order 2015 that states whenever the national anthem is sung or played, the audience shall stand to attention. So there are some laws which may not be, you know, completely a legal wrong, but somewhere it would be considered as, you know, something that is not right and the, you know, the officials can take one to task. So therefore, there may be an intersection with more, which may be moral and which may not really be legally wrong but may not be considered as even sometimes constitutionally right. So next, apart from that is we have general obligations, general obligations, it may be general obligation, what general, you, you have an obligation to study. You are obligated to study. Your parents are paid the fees, you are bound to study. General obligations, it may be moral, sometimes it may be even legal. Like breach of moral obligations may not always give rise to breach of legal obligation. Examples, duty to obey parents, it's a moral duty duty to provide for old parents now listen here now duty to provide for your parents it's moral as well as legal depending upon the jurisdiction it depends upon the jurisdiction where uh, where they say that uh, you know if a, if a child does not provide for the parents you know uh, the the parent can easily file a case against the child and claim those rights for example in india it is moral as well as legal now, in India, in case a, a child does not support the parent, including a married daughter, and the, the parents have no means of income, then under Section 125 of the Criminal Procedure Code, they, uh, a parent can file a petition before the court, and um, the court will, you know, somehow bind even a married daughter, even if it's a married daughter or a son, whoever is there, the children, and they obligate, they somehow trust the obligation over the children to support their parents. So sometimes moral and what is moral and what is legal depends upon jurisdiction to jurisdiction. There can be an intersection between moral and legal. Sometimes general obligations can also be a, can be, can amount to legal obligation. Now an individual legal obligation is an obligation that can be enforced by law, enforced in the court of law. Now Black's Law Dictionary defines legal obligation as an obligation or a duty which can be enforced by a court of law and the term that describes the obligation or duty that is enforced by a court of law it can be a debt and the legal responsibility to carry out what the law asks for example when the court issues summons to make oneself present in the court when the court issues an order or a summons you call it a summons to make oneself present in the court on the any particular day date time and the venue is given, the court venue, as mentioned in the summons, that means there is a legal obligation to whom the summons is issued to make themselves present in the court, to make themselves available and be present at the court. Now, legal obligation may be at individual level, corporate level, social level, and national level, or even international level. Legal obligation may be personal legal obligation, contractual legal obligation, moral obligation, absolute legal obligation, express legal obligation, and penal or uh, oh yeah, penal legal obligation or criminal legal obligation. Not complying or meeting legal obligations would amount to contravention of law and would attract legal consequences. That means, of course, if you do not oblige or if you do not comply with those legal obligations which are thrust upon you, that would amount to contravention of law and would attract legal consequences. For example, just stop at the zebra crossing when somebody is crossing or you know or whenever there is this traffic uh, you know traffic lights on like when there is a red signal you're bound to stop so if you don't do that it would amount to contravention of law so this is all for legal obligation this is a quite a simple chapter so apart from legal obligation we will move on to the next chapter and we will um, learn about What is private law? So any questions on legal obligation or on obligation itself? No, please, no question at all. Okay, thank you. So next is private law. What is private law? So laws can be private law or it can also be public law. So what is private law? 
Now, private law, as a free dictionary defines, is that portion of law that defines, regulates, enforces, and administers relationship among individuals, association, and corporations. Now, as used in distinction to public law, that means which is different from public law, the term means that it is that part of law that is administered between citizen and citizen, or that is concerned with the definition, regulation, and enforcement of rights in cases where both the person in whom the right inheres and the person upon whom the obligation rests are private individuals. So basically, they're trying to say is there is, you know, a private law normally governs parties where there is a person in whom there is a right vested in a person, there is a right vested or right in hers, that is a person has an inherent right. And there is another person who is obligated to perform the duty as per the right that is inherent in this person. So that is private law. So that basically governs private individuals. Sometimes it can be even corporation, private corporations, associations, and so on. So that is private law. Private law is distinct from public law. It differs from public law. While private law governs the relationship between private individuals, public law administers the relationship between government and individuals. So that is the basic difference between private and uh, you know, public law. Private law governs the relationship between private, relation, private individuals, whereas public law administers the relationship between government and individuals. So public law, for example, you say constitutional law, criminal law, and so on. Now, some examples of private law in this application, of course, contractual terms, contractual edicts or terms, marriage laws, professional relationships, property laws, intellectual property law. What is intellectual property? Copyrights and so on. Law of thoughts and so on. These are examples of private law where the private right of a party uh, is, you know, infringed. That's what we said that when there is a person who, you know, has an inherent right or we said we use the word in her. So in her means a person has an inherent right and that right has been infringed by another party. So that's where uh, when there is a contravention of a law, you know, uh, there is a, a contravention of the law and there is an obligation on the other party to follow the law and there is a contravention. That's how the person gets a right to enforce that right in the court of law and you know, receive compensation. For example, law of thought. So that's how we said that law of thought is an example of private laws. In law of thoughts, we learn that there has to be a duty that duty is you know not performed and then as a result of that there is a harm that is caused and the person who is harmed has got the right to claim it uh, you know claim compensation in the court of law so therefore private law governs relationship between private individuals public law for example it's constitutional law and criminal law it normally administers or deals with relationship between government and individuals. Private law also may be referred to as a doctrine that governs the relationship between private individuals, private entities, or private organizations. Now, the main characteristics of private law are as follows. One is creates autonomy with the freedom to carry on an activity until the law allows of a bits. That means it, it revolves around the principle of autonomy. It creates autonomy. It creates a freedom or an autonomous freedom to carry on an activity until and unless the law allows it or it forbids it. Then it is based on the principle of equity, that is to, you know, and it, it is based on the principle of equity, that means an egalitarian model that which treats everyone equal before the law. So you can say that private law is based on an egalitarian model of principles of equity, which treats everyone equal before the law. In case the private law is related to the government of the state, that would mean an individual will be deprived of any sovereignty. So that's what they're saying. Suppose in case the private law is related to government or the state, that means individual will be deprived of any sovereignty. Next is, it is mostly related to individuals creating ensuing obligations to regulate an individual private relationship or business or transaction. Best example is contractual law. And private law is a positive law. So these are some of the features of private law. Now, what is the nature of private law? Of course, it it, you know, it uh, tries to govern the relationship between parties, individual parties. Private law seeks to protect private interests. So the juridical nature of private law is basically reflected in its characteristic of exclusivity. That means where the parties are involved. Example, law of thought, there are two parties or group of parties where one person harms or a group harms and the other person, uh, you know, is harmed. One harms and the other is harmed. 
So one injures and the other is injured party, the aggrieved party. So basically there is an exclusivity exclusivity quality here. So private laws also operate within the scope of its objectives, example, contractual law, and the main object being governing the relationship of individuals within a state or parties to a contract or representatives in a given setup of public administration or even society. So that is private law. That's the nature of private law. What are the sources of private law? From where does private law emanate? The sources of private law, of course, are the law itself, that is a legislation. Again, I'm repeating, you can use the word legislation. The sources of private law, are, of course, legislation, that is a statute promulgated by the parliament, custom, jurisprudence, doctrine, or general principles of the law itself. What is the purpose of private law? The purpose of private law, of course, it provides certainty. It tries to you know, concretize the rights of individuals. It provides certainty for individual parties. I'm repeating, it tries to concretize the rights of individuals. Purpose of private law, I'm repeating, it tries to concretize the rights of individuals. Then it provides legal certainty for individual parties and the state legal security is assured. And it also supports or aids in achieving stability and precision. It brings about stability and precision. So that's all. These two chapters are a bit small, and this is all I want you to know. You can do additional reference and build your answers around the points that has been discussed during this class. So this is all about individual obligation, how a person is obligated towards the law, general obligation and legal obligation. And this revolves, the legal obligation revolves around the concept of ignorantia lex non exclusive, which you, it must be there in your answers for me. That means ignorance of law is not excused. Then we have learned about private law, which basically deals with the interests of private parties or individual parties, or where one person, there is an inherent right. Normally, if there is an inherent right and the other person is obligated to, you know, to comply with a particular duty. And basically it governs a relationship between two individual parties or corporations or any two individual, you know, uh, you know, bodies or association, but basically it is a, it is private in nature. It, it, it is something about, you know, where there is an inherent right, where legal security is assured, where it concretizes the, the legal rights of a person, interests of a person, concretizes legal, in private legal relationship between people, and it tries to bring about stability and precision directly pointing out what are the rights of the parties. So this is all for individual legal obligation and private law for today. Now, apart from that, there was a question that, is he there today? Um, Isse asked me, Isse asked me a question on unlawful apps. No question at all. Okay. So, no is, sorry? There's no any question at all. Ah, okay. Thank you. Uh, no, Isse, uh, your classmate Isse, is he there today? Is that some time now? Okay, he is absent, but well, I will deal with that answer now. Isi asked me a question about unlawful acts, and he says that the Civil Code of Somalia deals with unlawful acts under, you know, Article 160 to 69. So probably he will catch up with the answer when he views this video. So what's the difference between, he asked me for the law of torts, of course, but I would like to deal it with jurisprudence because... Jurisprudence deals with how laws are made, the whys of the laws, hows, whys, whats. So that's the reason I'm dealing with this question in this class. Uh, he asked me, what's the difference between torts and unlawful acts? Could you please make some comparison between torts in common law and civil law systems since we are a civil law country? So now, while dealing with this question, I just want you to know the meaning of unlawful act. See, there are two things in law. One is something that is called as illegal, okay? 
there is something called as legal, what is legal and what is illegal, and there is something called as lawful and what is unlawful. Now, there is a thin line of dif differentiation between, or you can call it as a semantic differentiation between what is unlawful and what is illegal. Listen to me carefully, because there is a thin line of differentiation or semantic differentiation between what is unlawful and what is illegal. It's a good question, actually. Now, what is unlawful? Black's Law Dictionary says that anything which is not authorized by the law is unlawful. Okay, we will wind up. We'll wind up. There are 10 minutes. Again? So Black's Law Dictionary says that anything which is unlawful, uh, sorry, which is unauthorized or not authorized by law is unlawful. See the meaning here. I'm repeating. Black's Law Dictionary says that anything, any act or omission, which is not authorized by law, is called as unlawful. That means it can be an unlawful act or unlawful omission. Now, what is legal, illegal? Now, illegal basically, again, Black's Law Dictionary says that illegal, uh, illegal act or illegal omission is an act or omission uh, that is forbidden by law. See the difference here. One is not authorized by law. You're not authorized to do that. It's so it's an unlawful act. And the other part is, it is forbidden by law. So that is illegal. Anything that is forbidden by law is an illegal act. So he asked me a question, what is an unlawful act? Okay. And what is the difference between tort and unlawful act? So tort, you know that tort is a civil wrong. The definition of tort is a civil wrong. Tort is basically, I mean, it's a concept which is used in common law countries, but as I said earlier, and I sent you some extracts of your Somali civil code, you could see there that tort is also a part of civil code. Then it may not be as part of a separate text or, you know, it, it need not be dealt under separately as law of tort. But however, it comes under the civil code. Just like Somalia, you also had Switzerland, which is actually a civil law country. Switzerland, France is a civil law nation. Now, even in Switzerland, the concept of tort is incorporated in the civil code or in the Swiss civil code. So now coming to the question, what is the difference between civil law countries and common law countries is basically that common law countries are you know, they basically have a judge-made law or they rely heavily on judicial precedence. And it is this judicial precedence which lay even basis for the law. However, civil law countries is predominantly, a, 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 you know, our countries which rely on predominantly legislations or, or, you know, where laws are passed by the parliament. Now, it cannot be denied that even in common law nations, we have parliaments, for example, in India, you know, UK, but however, the roles are different. We, they have the, or even in Australia, there is a concept of separation of power there. So of course the parliament or, or the legislature makes laws. We know that the judiciary adjudicates the laws and the, you know, the executive implements the laws. However, still civil law countries rely heavily just on what is mentioned on paper on those legislations, but common law countries, what is mentioned on paper, what are those legislations? Apart from that, the, judge, the judges or the courts are given a, a little leverage to interpret the laws based on the facts of, and circumstances of each case before them. So they're given the leverage of interpretation Whereas in civil law nations, there is no much scope for interpretation of laws 
Of course, we do interpret the laws, but judicial proceedings are not really, you know, uh, they are not really reported, not really reported, they are, but they are not really reported to the extent that they are really, you know, compulsorily followed. So judicial proceedings, so the basic difference between any civil law country and a common law nation is that common law nations basically rely on judicial proceedings or, you know, the judgments of the court in simple terms. And civil law nations, they have, you know, or place their uh, reliance or, or predominantly it is, you know, a statute-based statute uh, countries or they rely on statutes or they rely on legislations or they rely on enactments or by the legislature. So that is the basic difference. Now, speaking about tort, sometimes they might, might have, depending upon which country it is, they might have, uh, you know, different set of laws, which may be called as tort, or, you know, they might just give some other name for it as well. So basically say law of torts. However, not all countries have that. Like I gave you the example of Switzerland as well. It is incorporated in the civil code. Even in Somalia, it is incorporated in the civil code. Are you understanding me? So it need not be a separate uh, you know, law there, but it is, of course, it is a wrong. What is a civil wrong is a civil wrong, and that is incorporated in the civil code of that particular country. So I hope this answers his question, which says that, Teacher Somalia Civil Code stipulates in Articles 160 to 69 unlawful acts. So what's the difference between tort and unlawful acts? I told you what is tort is a civil wrong. And we all also studied in tort that comes from the word tortum and so on, twisted. And unlawful acts, I gave you the definition according to Black's Law Dictionary. What is unlawful? Unlawful, I said there is a semantic difference between a slight difference, a hairline differentiation between what is unlawful and what is illegal. Unlawful, I'm reiterating so that it goes into your mind. It's not necessary that what is unlawful is always illegal. Remember this. It's not necessary what is unlawful is always illegal. I want to sound in. Unlawful Generally speaking, see, a person who is not a, you know, a student of law, who is not from the field of law, might confuse between the terms unlawful and illegal. Okay, it's the same thing, fine. Generally, yes. But if you really have to see from the you know, a law student's perspective, what is unlawful, there is a clear differentiation there. Of course, a hairline differentiation, the semantic differentiation, which says what is unlawful, that means it's not authorized by the law, that is unlawful. And what is forbidden by the law is illegal. Example, carrying of arms is illegal. Just to carry arms and ammunition, it's illegal. You cannot carry that. You cannot carry arms and ammunition with you. That's illegal. Now, you see? So how this answers this question. Okay, the next thing he says is, can you please make some comparison between tort and common law and civil law? Okay, so I told you the basic difference is um, it being a judge-made law and uh, I gave you another differentiation saying that what actually practically happens in these countries that the concepts of tort are incorporated in their civil code. They have a civil code, like how you have a civil code and in that it's already incorporated. I give you example also of uh, Swiss civil court, Switzerland civil court. So that's it. So I hope that satisfies this question. Just let him know that you can watch this video. So that's all from my side and your attendance. All of you are present except Issei. So attendance will be granted. Thank you. Any questions? No, no question, very good. We are all present. Issei okay. today is not Thank you, teacher. Okay, we close now. Bye-bye. Goodbye.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well done.